This old Hemi goes pretty good. It does look like you need a tugboat to make a U-turn, doesn't it? This thing is just so huge. Longer, leaner, lower. Welcome to the 1958 Imperial. All new for 1958. This is the kind of car rich guys drove when I was a kid. This is the Imperial convertible, massive 392 Hemi. I believe it's the last year of the Hemi engine, about 345 horsepower. This was about the biggest American car you could get at the time, certainly the widest one. It can fall into the category, I guess, of original and unrestored with one minor difference, which I'm gonna take it over to the shop later, put it up on the lift and you'll see what I'm talking about. These things just make me laugh. They are so enormously huge. You drive down the street and there's people go, what, 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 what is that thing? And you wonder how many 16 year old girls took their driver's tests on these things. Just back it into everything, massive chrome bumpers. I, I, I believe it's the widest American car ever built. Look, look at this thing, it barely fits in my garage at home. In fact, it doesn't actually fit in my garage at home. You know, Chrysler was the first to have the wraparound windshield and a whole bunch of other features. And the A-pillar is way back here. Not great in a rollover, but fantastic for visibility. It's like driving a drive-in movie theater. You can just see everything. And it's got the torsion bar suspension, or torsion air, I think they called it. But you know, you get on the road, you see a pothole, you don't even realize you hit it. I mean, this is the definition of the term boulevard drive. You drive with one finger, with the effortless power steering, with the power brakes. It's, it's a lot of fun. This was Virgil Exner. He was the designer for Chrysler. This was called the forward look. You know, the previous president of Chrysler, he didn't believe they should be the only car men couldn't wear his hat in while he was driving. So consequently, all Chryslers were high like this. And Virgil Exner came in and brought in this leaner, lower look, the forward look, as, as they called it. And this is not a Chrysler Imperial, it's an Imperial. Uh, the Imperial name has been around since about 1926. Back then it was the Chrysler Imperial. Then in the early 50s, 1955 to be exact, Chrysler wanted to compete with Cadillac and Lincoln. Cadillac was not a Chevrolet, it was a Cadillac. Lincoln was not a Ford, it was a Lincoln. So they took the name Chrysler out and they made it its own separate division. And everything is different on this from a standard Chrysler 300. The axles, it's, it's bigger, it's beefier, it's stronger in the Imperial. In fact, this was what I thought was a myth, but turned out to be true. Back in the 60s and 70s, at demolition derbies, they banned Imperials because they were so strong and had an un unfair advantage. You could just hit the other cars and crush them and roll over them. And nothing ever dented these things. The frame is massive. This car weighs 5,600 pounds. It's pretty amazing. And in 1955, Virgil Exner, when he came out with the forward look, and he based on a car, a Chrysler parade car he built in 1952, which the city of Los Angeles still owns. In fact, we got to do a video on it uh, a couple of years ago. Here it is. Okay, that car was the basis for the 55 Imperial, which of course led to this. It always had the Hemi engine, at least up until 1958. After that, it went to the 413 in, in the Imperial. But this is one of the great motors. You know, this is the engine all the drag racers wanted, all the kids wanted for their 32 Ford. You went to a junkyard and you tried to find a mid-50s Chrysler. You pull out that Imperial engine. I remember a friend of mine when we were in high school, there was a lady in our town who had one of these immaculate, and he tried to buy it just so we could rip the engine out and put it in his whatever hot rod it was. I mean, at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do now, of course. It's heresy, but uh, it's, just, it's just the way it was. This one has 15-inch wheels on it. I upgraded the wheels. You know, the first ones had 15-inch wheels, and for the next few years, they went to 14-inch wheels because it made the car sit a little lower. But I like the 15s. It rides better with the 15s. And plus, these are radials. And believe me, you need radials in this car. Well, there was a guy named Tom McHale who uh, did road tests for Popular Mechanics magazine. And uh, he took one of these out and said, handles like a sports car. <laughs> I'm not sure what sports car he's thinking about. But, uh, but you know, actually, that being said, it doesn't drive bad at all. It actually drives and handles very nicely. In fact, let me show you, uh, let me show you that engine that I was talking about. Look at the size of this hood. 
And the nice thing about this car is it's all pretty original, except for one extremely important fact, which I'm going to show you up on the lift in just a minute. You may have guessed that already by looking in the engine compartment here. Big four-barrel carburetor, 392 cubic inch, 345 horsepower. I'm not sure what the torque is. Uh, I still think one of the sexiest valve covers around. Pretty, pretty cool car this thing is. Come around the back, I'll show you one of the controversial styling things of this car. It's like a 20 minute walk to get from the front bumper to the back bumper. You're exhausted by the time you get back here. It's like, oh, it's like walking the dog, taking this, getting to the back of this car. And you got these kind of gun sight tail lights. And now the noise you hear in the background, they're working on the building next door. I can't help that, so don't worry about it. Uh, this spare tire cover, there's no spare tire. These look, actually, they call this the toilet seat. This looks like a giant toilet seat. It's not the most attractive aspect of the car, but it, it, it kind of gives it a flavor of the period. Look at that trunk. Now, if you want to make a little extra money, you can rent this trunk out to a family of four because there's all kinds of room back here. Full-size spare tire. Got to have your... This is the days when you got a service manual, okay? Now you get a stupid DVD that says, do not drink contents of battery, but they don't tell you how to fix everything. This tells you everything, how to adjust the valves, how to do everything on it. You gotta get one of these. This car has an interesting history. You know, about uh, 10 years ago, I bought a 1967 Chrysler Imperial from a gentleman who was a uh, movie producer. If you go to Jay Leno's garage, you look on the website, you can see that video. Uh, well, he also owned this car back in 1958. And he took Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and all the movie stars of the day. He told me they got to drive this car and ride in this car and all that kind of stuff. Well, a buddy of mine bought this car from him about 20 years ago. And he went and he had the engine redone. But then he's driving it back from the engine uh, rebuilders and any time he went over 40 or 50 miles an hour, the car would, it would bog down. And he just got, they couldn't figure out what was wrong. He kind of got discouraged. So it kind of sat in the carport for a while. Uh, then 20 years go by. Uh, he tells me he wants to sell it. I said, well, I'd like to buy it. I took it out, tuned the carburetor, did everything, still bogging down when, we, uh, when you get up in the freeway. We couldn't figure out what was going on. Anything over... 50, 60 miles an hour, just, just go like that. Well, it turns out the guy who rebuilt the engine, the cam timing was off by one tooth. Once we fixed that, boy, it ran like a champ. And uh, it still runs like a champ. Gas mileage, gas mileage is not, not something you want to brag about. But it's a lot of fun because you can literally take everyone you know in this car. Come on and show you the interior of this car. It has all the options that were popular back in the day, electric seat, electric windows, uh, just the biggest gauges of any car I've ever seen. Look at this thing, just huge. Compared to a modern dashboard, it's pretty empty. You just have a radio, there's no FM or anything like that. All right, look at the turn signals. This is what you turn signal left, turn signal right, in the most awkward place possible. Release emergency brake right here like that, boom, boom. Look how far away the door is. You actually have to do this in tech. All right, let's go. Purrs like a kitten. Mm -mm. Okay, before we uh, take it for a ride, I'm gonna put it next door, put it up on the uh, lift, and show you what I think is the most important thing you need to do to any car like this. Come on, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Brakes are not something you want to screw around with, especially something that weighs <laughs> close to 5,000 pounds and has no seat belts, but it will very soon. So we always call our friend Dustin at Wilwood. You know, they can manufacture brakes for almost any possible situation. Now, though we have, obviously, the best guys here, when it comes to brakes, you really want to go to the experts. And, and these guys are really terrific. This thing had four-wheel drums that were just not very good. You they started locking up on me. One wheel would lock up. We, and this seems to be a common problem with these early crashers. So we just said, let's go to four wheel disc brakes. And um, it was a bit of a challenge because the Imperial is a whole separate line from all the other Chryslers. 
Everything is bigger, beefier, a couple of millimeters thicker. I mean, everything is completely different. So anything they have for the standard Mopar stuff is not going to fit in Imperial. So they did a custom job here. So uh, Dustin has aged probably 25 years in the last, <laughs> just, just working on it. But it's just incredible now. So tell us what was involved here. Well, for starters, you're right. This axle is not like anything you find in any kind of production car that we're used to working on. For, you know, the axle itself is not a flanged axle with a pressed on bearing. It's got a, a tapered roller bearing in it. So the first thing we had to do is get those centered right so that the axle stuck out of the tubes the same amount on both sides. Right. And then from there, it was just a matter of making brackets and custom hats and getting the right size caliper to go on. And of course, pushing it all as far inboard as we possibly could so that we could fit your wire wheels on it, which is the, the biggest part of the challenge with disc brakes is trying to get everything inboard so the wheels still fit. Now we have modern disc brakes that are so superior to anything else on the rest of this car. It's really amazing. How about the front? Let's take a look at the front and show, because originally we were going to do discs in front and keep the drums in the back. I figured that'd be a good way to go, but that didn't work either way. That didn't work out at all. The, the rear drums were really touchy. Uh, you could get them adjusted just right, but they wouldn't really stay in adjustment very well. Uh, and they, they would just kind of start dragging and releasing out of nowhere. Right. And, uh, and they also had a really big wheel cylinder, which became a problem with the master cylinder, because right. now you've got to take up all of that wheel cylinder before you really get the brakes activating leads to really long pedal travel, which is not very confidence inspiring. Yeah, that was, that was all the scary. way around, it just yeah. wasn't working out. Yeah, yeah. So we just went to the four wheel disc. And the nice thing is the emergency brake is on the drive shaft. So we didn't lose. Right. That was the only easy part about this whole yeah. thing is at least we didn't have to try to put an e-brake in it. Right. It's already on the drive shaft and we didn't have to touch it. And the reason we have an e-brake is because these early crushers, there was no park. You just had neutral and then you press the emergency brake. Right. And so a lot of times, I mean, I did it once and I just left it in neutral thinking, you know, I'll put it in neutral, walk away. What's following? Hey! <laughs> the thing was rolling after me. It always ran me over. So I said, okay, okay, let's, let's get do this. Let's show the front. Show the beautiful job you did here. The front, uh, again, unique challenge because you've got a really heavy car. According to our lift, it actually weighs 5,600 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> I think the front bumper is at least 700 of that. Yeah, it's a pretty heavy um, car. But... Uh, you know, it's this really heavy car, you've got to have an adequate amount of brake in there. So we want as big a rotor as we can get uh, with a big super light caliper. But again, you've got to get it all inboard to fit in the wheels. And we had to start with a custom machined hub because the five on 550 pattern is so big. We literally couldn't even use any of our standard forgings. Right. So we couldn't even start from a forging like we prefer to do. We had to start with like an eight inch billet round and cut the hub out of it. Right and then get everything on it, get everything inboard. Uh, nice four piston, super light caliber, 12 inch rotor, stops really well. See, I like the challenge he's got. Like when I go to the factory, they, see, they, they, they lock the door and they hide, and I go, I know they're there. <laughs> it's, it's a business day, it's 11 o'clock, yeah, but they hide like there's no, so, no, so I just wait and then they come out, okay. And, but some of the guys really like, Dustin really sees this as a challenge. This is, uh, it isn't just some boring Camaro or Mustang you're sticking on. Absolutely, no. it's not. Okay. It's, it's a challenge and it's, it's always interesting, uh, you know, way more interesting than, than uh, you know, some of the kind of more mundane right. R&D work we do. Uh, it gives us, a, you know, a challenge to do something totally custom, totally different, and really learn something. You know, yeah. part of the thing with this car is it has a really different style vacuum booster. You know, it's a, instead of being a, a can with a diaphragm, it's got this bellows arrangement and uh, you know, none of us had ever seen anything like that before, so that was really interesting to dig into. And, and this is the single biggest improvement you can make to an old car. There's nothing you can do, a crate engine, I don't care what you're talking about, making it stop. That's the most important thing because you probably start 100 feet shorter in this now. Easily. Easy. Yeah, easily, because you step on the right, you just slide right through. I mean, it was... And it's, disc brakes are just so much more repeatable and predictable. Right, right. You know, with, with drum brakes, you hit the pedal, you might change lanes depending on which, which uh, tire, you know, um, starts slowing down right. first. Disc brakes, they're just really repeatable. You'll get the same stopping distance. You'll, the car will be predict handled predictably when you hit the pedal. Uh, you know, it just really makes a dramatic yeah, improvement. Disc, disc brakes and radial tires. You know, a lot of guys get these old cars and they want to have the original bias ply tires. 
Oh my God, they're so dangerous. They really are. You know, you go around, if, if the exit says 35 miles an hour with bias plays, you're going 36. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's screeching <laughs> and you're sliding. You know, but or you catch this, a groove in, a free, in the freeway yeah, and yeah. it just pulls you into the other lane. Let's show them that brake booster we were talking about. Let me, bring right. it, let me bring it down a little bit. Okay, that's the bellows type, uh, type booster he was talking about right there. Right, so, so what you have there up on the top is that bellows booster, that big black collapsible looking thing. And below it is a custom made master cylinder uh, that we put together. It's a, a tandem master cylinder, so it's got two outlets, and it's got a setup with remote reservoirs, so you can get the reservoirs out of the way of right. the bellows. And that's actually a new product we'll be featuring at the SEMA show this year, and, and uh, uh, we think is really gonna fill a niche in our product line and in the hot rod world. And it was, it was really the only way to put a modern style master cylinder on this beast. Now, anybody that has a 50s or 60s Mopar, it's much easier. It's not an Imperial. It's much easier to do a brake job in it. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, yeah. to, you know, as you get cars get a little bit more modern, they really standardize. You start seeing, you know, kind of standard canister boosters. Right. You know, spindles have much more commonality, and we have brake kits for, gosh, I think starting early '60s Mopars yeah. all, all the way through the mid '70s. Anything you think of as a muscle car, we've got brake kits yeah, that are off the know, shelf for that. I, I, we just do it by experience. It's not like we're doing a commercial here because we just use the suppliers we use. A lot of times you'll call brake places and they'll send you a kit, but it's a universal kit. You know, it's, it's, it's disc brakes that fit anything, which means it fits nothing, you know. Whereas it, they tailor to your specific automobile, Mopar, Chevy, Chrysler, whatever it might be. You know, so it's, it's pretty cool. We really work to engineer a solution that really fits the car right. and is really designed for it. Well, now we'll be able to uh, go for a ride and I'll actually be able to stop this time. But these cars had one brake line. Oh my God, if that failed, that was, well, that, that was it. It failed. Was it. The that, whole thing that failed. That was it. It failed. Dustin, thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Now we can safely go down the road and run over Volkswagens and Passats and all, all kinds of cars. <laughs> no problem. So thanks for doing this. Just great. Just thank you. Great. Give them a call if you've got a project like this. They can help you out. Back in 1958, this is what a successful person drove. Not a Mercedes, that only had six cylinders. Rolls-Royce still had six cylinders, although the eight was coming in. Uh, big American cars, Lincolns, Cadillacs, and the biggest of them all, the Imperial. Back in these days, the American car was a whole different breed. I mean, you got electric windows, air conditioning, V8s, 300, 400 horsepower. Most European cars barely had 100 horsepower. And this thing with this torsion suspension, or torsion air suspension as they call it, uh, God, it, it rides so comfortable, it's smooth. It's, <laughs> there's no road feel of any kind, but that's okay. Just kind of float down the road a little bit. On a summer's day, this meets the definition of a land yacht. You can water ski behind this thing. Little vent window, look at that. Although in later cars, that would be electric also. Once you get over the size, it's actually very nice to drive. And these seats, you know how hard you'd have to look now to find a car seat with no actual support of any kind? It's almost impossible. And the disc brakes make all the difference in a car like this. I mean, if you've never driven a car from the 50s or even the early 60s, it's unbelievable how, how bad the brakes are. Whereas now, this stops like a modern car. I've got radial tires on it. You know, braking is even more important than performance because you can stop quicker. Kid pulls out on the bike or something. Oh my God. It really is different between saving your life. This whole Hemi goes pretty good. It does look like you need a tugboat to make a U-turn, doesn't it? This thing is just so huge. As I said, this car is pretty much original and unrestored. It's been cleaned up, a few things have done to it. Uh, it's got a little body rod along the base under the uh, rocker panel. And it had a, a respray sometime in the mid-60s, or maybe early 70s, late 60s. 
this kind of cream color. It's supposed to be white. I'm going to go back to the white. I, I'd like to make it uh, pretty much as it was. A few things are sticking. The electric antenna is not working properly and a few other things. But for the most part, it's just a nice, good old girl that has not been uh, messed with at all. That's, that's a horn. Let's put our camera around the back and give you an idea of what it's like to, to ride in one of these things. It's so huge. Hop in. Got all the objects and even a little trash bucket comes with the car right there. Anything over 40 miles an hour, the trash all blows all over the place. It's the kind of car you feel like Sinatra should be playing on the radio, you know? There's your speedometer. Look how big it is. There's your clock. They've got full complement of gauges. At your gas, at your oil pressure, battery generator, and of course your temperature. Now you push buttons here. I like the Imperial logo. It looks like uh, Imperial margarine with a little crown on there. And you can take seven other people in this car. They only built about 560 of these convertibles in 58, so it's a pretty rare car. I always wonder if cars like this will reach the full status of classic that like Duesenberg and Pierce Arrows from the 20s and 30s did. Because when I was a kid, you could buy these for nothing, a couple of hundred bucks. They used them, as I said, in demolition derbies, although the Imperials were banned. Uh, you know, guys just beat them to death. But they, they occupy a certain time period in American history, you know. We're, the space race has just started. We're going to go to the moon. Uh, we had won the war. I mean, when the West, rest of the world had barely any cars at all, I mean, Americans are driving some big, giant V8s with electric windows. And oh, it's hilarious. I like with the mirrors on the dashboard here instead of hanging in front of your face. I want to thank Dustin and the guys at the Willwood for uh, doing the disc brakes. Boy, this thing stops and drives wonderfully now. That's the biggest fear with these old cars is brakes. Modern cars can stop so quickly and old cars can't. But now this one can stop just as good as a modern car. You know, I've got radial tires, I've got disc brakes, and it makes it a more fun, safe car to drive. And it really doesn't affect the value of the car in any way. I don't know why anyone would want original drum brakes that barely work. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this little trip down memory lane. We'll keep you posted on uh, what we do with this car. I think we are going to paint it and put it back to the original white. As I said, I'm not going to do a frame off on this car. We'll fix that little bit of body rot down at the bottom. Uh, and we'll probably put it back to the original white as it was. I'll clean up the chrome a little bit. Maybe do a little bit of upholstery work. And it'll be a brand new 1958 Imperial. Not Chrysler Imperial. Imperial. See you guys next week.